do feel like I'm cursed. I, I was preventing you from coffee earlier this morning, then I was preventing you from lunch, and now I'm preventing you from drinks. But despite evidence to the contrary, it's not my fault, it's, uh, it's Jason's. But you'll be delighted to hear that I'm not going to be the one speaking to you today, uh, or this, this afternoon anyway, and I'm joined by a very esteemed panel to my left, uh, whom I will introduce um, just briefly. But we're going to be talking about developments um, both in terms of regional arbitration rules, um, but also more globally, and how those can impact arbitration in the MENA region. And if I can then just start with uh, the first person to my left, which is Mr. Fernando Ortega. He's a senior associate at the Qatar law firm of Sultan Al Abdullah Partners. He's been in the region for around six years. He's a commercial construction and investment disputes specialist. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, recent developments under the OIC agreement. To his left, uh, you've already met Dr. Zain Chara, the senior legal counsel of the CEO's office at the Qatar International Court of Dispute Resolution. Um, and he's going to be talking to us a little bit more about various updates to the Qatari arbitration law. Uh, to his left, we have uh, Mustani Afaz, who's the deputy director of the ICC Middle East Representative Office, um, who has 10 years' experience in the region in both private practice and in house. Um, and lectures in business law and IP law at universities around the world. She's going to be talking to us about developments in the ICC rules and institutions rigidly. And last, but by no means least, we have again Mr. Zingjian Tao, managing partner of Decker China. Um, he's got numerous uh, accolades and memberships which I won't run into uh, at the moment, but he's going to be talking to us about a very interesting topic, which is what the Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative means for international arbitration. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Fernando and uh, we'll do a questions, uh, questions and answers session at the end. Thank you both for the introduction, I appreciate that. Before I begin, I want to uh, just say thank you to Google Plus and, and uh, uh, Kluwer, Walter Kluwer for giving me the opportunity to be able to speak to you on this topic today. Uh, my topic is recent developments under the OIC agreement and implications for investors. Uh, we've had some recent developments this year, that, or, I'm sorry, last year that, that have kind of changed the, the, the landscape on how to view the OIC investment agreement in that previously, a little bit more than a year ago, it wasn't really an option for investors to, to consider for investment arbitration or to find some kind of recourse for compensation. Uh, against any harmful act that might have been done by one of the member states. But what happened last year uh, kind of changed all that. And that's what I want to talk to you today. In doing so, I want to first start off by just briefly giving everyone a basic understanding of the OIC investment agreement, where a lot of people aren't, may not be familiar with it or may not have too much experience. So I want to uh, give you that small or short background on it. Then get into the recent developments that we, we saw last year and how, and then discuss how those, those developments are potentially, will potentially benefit <coughs> investors moving forward. So let's begin. So what, what, is, the, what is the OIC Investment Agreement? It's, it's an agreement that's under the, the umbrella of the Organization for Islamic Co Cooperation, the OIC. Um, under the, the OIC, there are about nine agreements, uh, and one of them is an investment agreement, and that is what I have up on the, on, the, on the screen there. It's the Agreement for the Promotion, Protection, and Guarantee of Investments among the member states of the Organization of Islamic Corporation, uh, Cooperation. Now there's 57 countries, member states under the OIC. Only 27 of them have ratified, signed and ratified this agreement. I've listed three there, but there's a few others I can mention, Pakistan, Iran, Oman, Kuwait, and a few others. Um, the agreement itself, the investment agreement itself, offers a few protections. I have them up there listed. It prohibits expropriation, it protects capital and assets, it provides free transfer and movement of capital and assets, and more importantly, it has a most favored nation clause. Um, let's keep our eye on that specific provision because that's where the recent developments have, have uh, come about. And, uh, well, what is the MMF clause? The MMF clause, I, I put down the language there specifically from the agreement, but in short what it is is that as a foreign investor, you will not be treated less favorably than another investor that's in that specific host country. So let me give you an example. 
if you're a Qatar investor and say you're operating in Saudi Arabia, and uh, there's other investors there, one from the UAE, one from the United States, and one from the UK, uh, whatever protections those investors are, are being uh, afforded to them under other treatments, the MMF provision says that you will also be able to be, have uh, uh, access to those provisions or those protections as well. So I put up an example there just to give you an idea of how it's been used under an OIC investment arbitration. It's the Al, Al Rarik uh, uh, versus Indonesian case. And there you have to claim and import uh, another provision called FET or Fair Equitable Treatment provision from the UK Indonesian BIT. So you had a Saudi investor in that case, the Saudi claimant, against the, the nation of Indonesia, and they imported a protection from another BIT, from the UK Indonesia BIT, and imported it into that arbitration and made claims under that <coughs> provision and actually won. So what, why is this such an issue um, under the OSA investment agreement? Um, primarily <coughs> that in the past, we have, in 2014, there were three arbitrations initiated against uh, Egypt, and, and it was done by a Saudi investor. Um, in all those cases, Egypt failed or actually refused to negotiate or to nominate a, a co-arbitrator. Under the rules, it says that you would have to, you would go then to the Secretary General of the OIC to request an appointment to be made on the state's behalf. The Secretary General at that time refused to do so. So therefore, the arbitration pretty much just uh, didn't go anywhere from that point. Um, there were a lot of reasons why it was given. Some say it was political pressure. Another, another is that Egypt has refused that the OIC agreement gives, uh, gives them or any other state consent to, to, to the dispute resolution mechanism under the treaty. Um, but what is important to understand here is that the, the arbitration just completely finished at that point and any kind of thought of actually bringing an arbitration under the OIC investment agreement was pretty much kind of done at that point. Um, I, I list the current Secretary General now for the OIC. He's also Saudi National. He's been there since 2016. And the only reason why I mention him is that because what has changed now has been under this, this case here, DS Construction, F, uh, FZ Co., uh, which was initiated at the end, towards the end of 2016. Um, and the same thing pretty much happened in that case where uh, Libya at the time was is the, the respondent state, decided not to appoint their arbitrator. And then the claimant at that point decided to go and request the Secretary General to make the appointment. And again, the Secretary General uh, refused or failed to do so. But this time, instead of saying that we're, we're going to, uh, you know, the, the arbitration was going to end at that point, the claimant did something pretty ingenious. They actually invoked the MMF provision and imported the 1976 Youth Trial Arbitration Rules that was contained in another BIT, in this case it was the Austria, Libya, Libya BIT, to, to, to use that mechanism to be able to go to the UN Central, or actually, I'm sorry, to be able to go to the, the Secretary General of the Permanent Court of Arbitration <coughs> to have them appoint a designate who will then appoint on behalf of the state an arbitrator. And that's a significant change here. Because now it opens up the OIC investment agreement uh, to, to, be able to, to be able to bring other arbitrations and then we'll stop the investor state from continuing on to, to put uh, restrictions on, um, uh, on any arbitration that's brought forth under the agreement by not appointing the arbitrator. I, I have two different clauses up there. Uh, and the reason why that's, it, that's the case is that uh, the, the claimant in the case decided to invoke the, the 2010 Youth Trial Rules which is Article 6.4. Um, but when the PCA Secretary General made their decision, they actually uh, they, they made a decision based on Article 6.2 of the 1976 rules. Uh, they pretty much say the same thing. Nothing has changed between the two. So there wasn't really an issue there. Uh, before I talk about the implications of the case further, I just want to actually just highlight one other, other case that, that has, is pending at the moment, that where we also see the MMF we potentially might see the MMF provision being used to go to exit arbitration. And there we have a, a group of telecommunication and service providers who uh, have brought a claim against Iraq. Um, and they've done it originally under the OIC investment arbitration agreement. Uh, however, the OIC investment agreement does not contain a provision for exit arbitration. 
but they've also, if you go on the Wix website, they've identified that another BIT that's been uh, uh, announced or actually identified within, within their claim is the Japanese Iraq BIT, and that has an exit arbitration provision. So the claimant here might have likely uh, invoked the MMF provision to go to be able to get to exit arbitration and bring their claims in front of exit. Now, so what are the implications here for investors? Like I, I probably mentioned briefly, um, it, this allows investors now protection from any promises made by the respondent states to be able to go into their countries to invest and they operate. Um, and doing so, it gives, a it gives an opportunity for the, the claimant or the company or the investor some type of recourse, some international arbitration. Um, we can potentially see the continued use of P PCA's Secretary General appointing their authority to, to be able to move arbitrations fur further. And also, you have to remember that the, the, the benefit of bringing an arbitration um, under the OIC agreement is you will get a final binding uh, award or judgment, depending on how you enforce it. Because under the OIC Investment Arbitration Treaty, you uh, any award or, or, or decision issued out of the tribunal will be issued as a judgment from the national court of that country. If it's taken outside of the, of the region or out of the OIC, it will be treated uh, as a foreign war, arbitral war, and be enforceable under the New York Convention. Uh, and then finally, this could potentially also be a recourse for Qatari investors who were harmed from the blockade. They now have an opportunity to be able to, to bring any harms that were, that were caused by the blockade to international arbitration uh, that didn't exist previously. And I'll just give you a quick example. Qatar and UAD and Qatar and the KSA do not have a BIT together or with each other. They only have the OIC investment agreement. So now they have an opportunity to be able to go to international arbitration. And but to Turkish contractors in Libya, we've seen a mass filing of, of claims against Libya by Turkish contractors and other investors. The, and they're doing it under the, the BIT between Libya and Turkey. Uh, there are some jurisdiction issues in that BIT that are currently being fought out in, in arbitration. Um, now with this new recent development with this case, the DS construction case, Turkish contractors as well as other investors may have a, a different set or another way of getting their claims heard or at least receive compensation uh, from any harm that was done by Libya. So that concludes my presentation and uh, thank you. Right, very, very interesting indeed, and I thought.